everybody. Welcome to Growing Up Geek, the weekly podcast for geek entertainment and nostalgia. My name is Brad, and I'm joined by my brother Matt. Hello. And my brother Rob. Hey, how's it going? This week we're going to be reviewing the infamous comic book Watchmen, but before we get to that, we're actually going to turn to the world of geek news for a moment, and uh, Rob and Matt have some news stories they want to share. Yep, here's what's going on. Um, Sony has recently announced a brand new SKU for the PlayStation 3. It comes packaged with Metal Gear Solid 4, and it comes with the DualShock 3 controller, which has all the the shaking that everybody misses so much. Uh, It's going to be released in June alongside Metal Gear Solid 4, and it Mm -hmm. will retail for about $500. Ask anybody when they've been waiting, or what they're waiting for to buy a PlayStation 3, and it's usually Metal Gear Solid 4, the format wars to be over, and for them to include DualShock 3. And that's all coming in this package. Yeah, I actually this week considered buying a PS3. Uh, now that Blu-ray is one, I want to start Netflixing those Blu-ray movies. And uh, that's the cheapest one on the market. So Yeah, it's the cheapest and the most versatile. PS3 is definitely building a, a library. It's got Ratchet, it's got Drake, it's got now Metal Gear, and, and quite a few others. So it, it'll be an interesting year. We'll have to see. Yeah, yeah I remember Matt predicted that by this summer, 2008, I would own a PlayStation 3. And <laughs> I've held out for a while now, but I- I'll admit, it's tempting to want to buy a PlayStation 3 just for the sake of Blu-ray. You know, honestly, I'm not even sure, though, if I'm interested in Metal Gear Solid anymore. It doesn't even feel real. It's been so long since mm. they announced it. Right. You know, Matt, I don't know if you're like me, but if I start researching it, Amber knows that there'll be a pretty quick period before I go out and actually buy it. And so this week I, I sort of said to her, I, I think I want a Blu-ray player. <laughs> and that that's normally a code for it's going to happen <laughs> within the next week or month. Oh, yeah. you Whether know. you want it to uh, or not, Amber. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Matt, are you like that with te- new technology? Are you at all like that? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's part frugal shopper, part are, you, are we just kind of like lying to ourselves and, and buttering our ourselves for the experience right (laughs) you know i don't i don't know take from that what you will but uh yeah i'm not quite sure what that meant yeah (laughs) (laughs) i'm I'm excited yeah we delete that now Uh, i have to name this episode buttering ourselves for the experience (laughs) there goes our clean rating on itunes yeah um, Yeah. oh geez the uh the DualShock controller, now I, I remember that they boasted that they were past silly rumbles and vibrations. Right. And everybody that <clears throat> knew what was what knew that it was that they were in a lawsuit over, right. over the rights to use it. Right, I'm well, going to say know, this. N- I don't take kindly to being lied to, you know. <laughs> it's like when Nintendo was saying, oh, we're not going to go to CDs because the future doesn't belong to CDs and... Now you look at the Wii, and that thing runs on a DVD drive. You know, it, it's right. it's just them but, making yeah. excuses for their internal politics. Right. I mm-hmm. so want Sony to win. I was such a fan of them with the PlayStation and the PlayStation Two, and yeah. they've become this sort of just stranger to me. You know, like every decision that they had made at the beginning was just so. It almost was like a comedy of errors. How many things they did wrong, and now I'm like, you know. Can they get it back? No, I don't think there's going to be any clear winner for this generation of consoles. And nobody really ever seems to hold the crown for longer than two generations. That's right. So, uh, okay, so that's Sony news. Uh, Have either of you guys heard of Double Twist? Uh, I have not. No, I've never heard of Double Twist. (laughs) Uh, DVD John Johansson, who some of you may know as the man who cracked the DVD encryption scheme and oh, thus okay. allowed a whole generation to begin yeah. to rip their DVD movies to their computer and share them over the internet. He also cracked mm-hmm. Apple's Fair Play DRM, uh, has begun to turn his skills into a profitable venture uh, with oh, wow. a company that he partially founded called Double Twist Ventures. And their very first software product is now available, I believe, as a beta called Double Twist which claims to allow you to move any media from any device to another, regardless of what digital rights management features it may have come with. So let's say you have a cell phone and you've downloaded a video onto it that you paid $5 for. Uh, If you can connect your cell phone to your computer, you can use Double Twist to rip it and send it to your iPod. And Double Twist takes care of the whole thing. Now, regardless of your opinion wow. on 
digital rights management and the direction it should go. This is absolutely going to be, you know, interesting to see what companies uh, attempt to stop this software from working. I've had ample debates with people about the merits of paying for your yeah. media and the enjoyment thereof. Yeah, I'm in favor of not stealing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> as an artist, I do care if someone steals my work, and I would care if I was a musician if someone stole my work. Sure. So. That's, that's how I weigh in on it. It's a complex argument, no, I know. But. I agree with you there. <laughs> but I could say a legitimate use. Owning a DVD that you want to put onto your iPod, right now you can use iTunes to do that. Yeah. Uh, oh, I now I do agree with you on right. that. If you own it, I think you should be able to back it up yourself. But so it, it sounds uh, like an interesting technology. Well, it's going to be controversial regardless. Sure. Yeah. It, it goes all the way back to, you know, uh, clubs don't kill people. Uh, cavemen kill people. <laughs> that old argument. Apparently, I've been seeing these commercials on TV. If you smoke marijuana, you get AIDS. <laughs> oh, there you go. I um, did not know that. It's kind of so a... that's true? Uh, yeah, the government actually no. created AIDS by extracting it from a marijuana plant. <laughs> okay, uh, breaking news. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, that uh, was the real news story there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, sarcasm light. Is it on? Is it off? We're not sure. Speaking of government-created marijuana <laughs> plants, yes. uh, they have just announced Terminator 4. Oh, uh, God. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Yes, there's some uh, <clears throat> good news, question mark? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I have heard a bit about this, and it's exciting. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> it, it starts off exciting. It quickly gets bad. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the official title of the movie is Terminator Salvation. The future begins. The future begins? Is that a tagline? Yep. How long do movie titles need to be now? Terminator Salvation, The Future, future Begins. begins. <laughs> the movie. And then the, you know they're going to pull an ID4 or an MIB on that. You know, and they're going to like, it's yeah, going to be like. TSTFV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's slated to come out in 2009. But anyway. Okay, so what's the good news? Uh, the good news, uh, I guess, is that John Connor is going to be played by Christian Bale. Yes. Ah. Uh, yes, this is exciting. Who is one of my favorite actors. Okay. Yeah. He is good. Very exciting, you know. And so enjoy that excitement for now. It's directed by Uwe Boll. No, 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 no. Are you serious? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. No. Oh, God. Okay. You gave me almost a near heart attack. <laughs> but it's almost as bad. It's directed by a guy whose name is Mick G. Oh, oh yeah. I know that. No, no, you know? no, no, no. Okay, Charlie's yeah. Angels was cool. Yeah, this guy, he did Charlie's Angels, uh, episodes of Chuck. Ouch. I mean, oh, it's cool, but it's no James Cameron. No, not and at all. And then on top of that, we're looking at writers who have worked together, and uh, we're looking at movies like The Net 2.0 and Catwoman. Oh, God. And, oh, no. And Terminator 3, Rise of the Machine. Uh, yeah. Ah. Which I, so, I, I didn't feel was anywhere near what Terminator 2 was. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if even the rippled abs mm. of Christian Bale can wash away it, it wasn't, the atrocities. It, it wasn't a terrible movie. No, not by any stretch, but Terminator Sarah Connor Chronicles is terrible. And so the Terminator franchise is sort of in the gutter right now. Um, I yeah. don't know how much harder they need to kick it. They need to kick it real hard. <laughs> That's the poster. Don't spoil it. Um, I mean, this is a franchise that, I mean, let's just admit, it it ended with Terminator 2. There shouldn't have been a Terminator. Yes, it ended. There shouldn't I, have been Now, I debate story. this yeah. because oh. I do feel to some extent like... Not on this show, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> even, if, even if you've basically destroyed all evidence of the Terminators coming back in time and thus prevent Cyberdyne from getting this leg up Skynet has to at some point in some universe been developed without technology from the future so no. it's a bit of an inevitability okay I, I didn't understand that but I, <laughs> exactly, I agree with Rob exactly why you think that uh, Terminator 2 ends it I'll rewind this podcast later listen to it and try to di and digest that argument oh yeah um, it'll blow your mind it will blow my mind hole at that <laughs> yeah. point but okay we've got news uh, so now let's turn to the world of comic books. Uh, this week, Matt and I read Watchmen, the infamous comic book written by Alan Moore and illustrated by Dave Gibbons. Um, uh, the plot, basically, Watchmen is mainly a story about costumed adventurers, quote-unquote. But it's a fictitious 1980s, and in this world, the government has actually passed a law called the Keen Act, which outlaws most of these costumed adventurers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when the book picks up, uh, one of the country's two legally sanctioned heroes uh, who called himself the Comedian is actually murdered. Um, and a vigilante named Rorschach uh, believes that someone is killing off these masked adventurers, or who he calls masks. Um, and he begins to interview, and as he interviews former heroes and former villains, we learn a whole lot about the world of masked adventurers. Um, as I said, Watchmen is infamous. Um, the cover alone, and I'm going to grab my copy here. And hold it up for people to see in the audience. The quotes on the back are pretty amazing. The one from the Lost co-creator, Damon Lindelof, says, The greatest piece of popular fiction ever produced. <laughs> Holy cow. So that leads me to you, Matt. Um, is Watchmen the greatest piece of popular fiction ever produced? It is It is pretty incredible on a lot of levels. Alan Moore is known for really taking in any genre that he's doing to its furthest extents. And, yeah, I think it's absolutely worth reading. It has a lot of stories within stories. Um, there's so many levels of dialogue that are layered. We have Rorschach writing in his journal and we're reading along uh yeah let me actually just real quickly read just i think this demonstrates how different of a of a book this is when you read the very first line in this book it's rorschach's journal and he says dog carcass in an alley this morning tire tread on burst stomach this city is afraid of me i've seen its true face that's like poetry yeah it's like poetic and honestly like matt said the book there is a lot a lot of levels yeah a lot of layers and uh, i mean and a lot of concepts that i think ones that really give you pause uh for so many of them including when you mention that there's really only one superhero in the world that really has superpowers right he's practically a deity right. he's so far beyond everyone else that mm-hmm. he almost doesn't know how to interact with him and yeah. and then you have you know the women that love him <laughs> and, and and that wow. that is also very a very interesting what if is it in the comic book who watches the watchman it is uh, some people graffiti that on the wall as sort of a message uh, i was at a, i was at a party over the summer and uh, there was a bucket of sidewalk chalk and after so many hours, I couldn't help but notice that. Well, it was one of those parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what <laughs> you know, parties are you going to? <laughs> there was uh, – somebody had sprawled that fairly fairly largely on uh, one, of the, one of the brick walls of the house. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Watchmen, to me, is actually more of a comic book about why someone would adventure – and um, I, I picked up a lot of similarities, and I shouldn't even say this because obviously it's, it's old enough to have inspired this, but Batman Begins um, mm-hmm. was a story that was very rooted in how Batman became Batman. Why would someone put on a mask? Why would someone put on tights? And uh, there are so many explanations, detailed uh, flashbacks, excerpts from memoirs. Oh, man. Um, the a character called the Night Owl actually describes the logic behind the choice of his costume. And so that's not necessarily... You know, an action-packed story. Um, and Alan Moore has said that it should be read, quote, in an armchair next to a fire with a steaming cup of coffee. Mm. Um, so, you know, as opposed to a lot of comics where it's like, you know... Under the sheets with a flashlight. That's, exactly. Yeah, that's funny you should mention that because I read it uh, I read it in the course of a weekend. It was my birthday. Mm-hmm. I was sprawled out on a couch and having hot tea brought to me in cups <laughs> is this another kind of party that you go to <laughs> no no this was my birthday uh that's cool and, it, and it's yeah it was an excellent way to read it absolutely yeah there is a movie uh being made of Watchmen, and this is something that's been a long time coming um, yeah, i was i was thinking about that today too it's not going to be an action movie no i well and that, if, that's... if it is they're messing it up well that's the thing is when i read this i immediately thought okay, this can't be like the 300, uh, which, right. interestingly enough, Zack Snyder, who directed the 300, <laughs> is the director yeah. of Watchmen. Oh, boy. Um, so I, I am very uh, intrigued. Um, last year, there was a rated R trailer for the 300 that was released, and if you go to the 1 minute and 52 second mark in that trailer, uh, the director actually inserted a single frame, and it's a frame of a masked man with a Rorschach pattern on his face. 
um, and it never appears in the in the 300. It is a tease frame of the Watchmen film, uh, the character Rorschach. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm excited. I've I've heard things like, for example, the artist upon reading the script uh, was enthused enough to begin to draw movie posters. <laughs> uh, one of which I was given. Oh. Thank you very much from by Colin at at New Dimension Comics in McMurray. Awesome. Yeah, it, uh, it's the comedian uh, being punched. Right. And uh, it's, it's you know, it's pretty sweet. Now, Alan Moore, when V for Vendetta came out, uh, declined to have his name put on the film. Right. It's the same with Watchmen. It, and it's a, it, it makes it kind of a, and I was thinking, how do you carry on creating a film of this work, loving this work, when you know that the creator does not want any part of it? You know, I guess you have to yeah. have really just a thick skin. Well, yeah, and, and some understanding of Alan Moore as, you know. Um, he's got an enormous beard, and uh, no no part of that beard will be entering the theater to see Watchmen. He does look a bit like a wizard, and I think that honestly might be what he's going for the most. There you go. Well, before we close out the show, we'd like to take a moment to reminisce a little bit with a little section <laughs> of nostalgia. And uh, this week, we would like to ask, whatever happened to point-and-click adventure games? Uh, I miss these little buggers. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but from my first five and a quarter floppy disk version of Sherlock Holmes, man, or King's Quest, um, full throttle. Oh man, I ain't putting my lips on that. And I, again, a specific genre of video games. You click on something and it says that is a rock. You know, or <laughs> or if you're Tex Murphy in in Under a Killing Moon, you know, you have some great witty comment when you click on it. You know, uh, why did these games disappear? Do you think P- people don't take the time to notice rocks? Ain't it the yeah. truth? I think it is definitely a shame that they're that they're not as prevalent anymore. Um, I think the the PC gaming market has become so much of a hit or miss market. What people are buying on the PC are first person shooters, real time strategy games, and massive multiplayer games. Yeah. And sadly, you know, adventure games, especially those of the point and click variety, just aren't you know making the kind of money that they need to mm-hmm. and. It's sad, and uh, it means that like it's a self-perpetuating problem because if, if they aren't going to be making money, studios aren't going to put the money behind them to make them the type of caliber that they should be. Right. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Matt, would... do you think the business has just taken over, or do you think people have gotten dumber? I mean... Well, gosh. Well, people have definitely gotten dumber. But, uh, <laughs> okay. no. I, I think uh, it's a bit of a natural evolution of the technology available. Mm-hmm. If you consider that, I, I think, was one of the Zorks entirely text-based? Uh, yeah, I, the first two were actually. Um, and, by the way, quick plug for MC Front a lot. Go and listen to, I think it is called It Is Pitch Dark. The chorus is, you are likely to be eaten by a Gru. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> sweet. Um, it is. Yeah, I nerd I, rap. Like the click-based adventure was really like it was really technologically impressive stuff. You look at Full Throttle. Full Throttle yeah. was basically a cartoon with uh, hand-painted backgrounds and uh, computer graphics, which was c- really cutting edge at the time. You know, it had yeah. all kinds of stuff. When a moment yeah. finally came in those games where like a monster was chasing you, or you had to like save somebody, anything that mm-hmm. was suddenly time limited the shot Mm -hmm. of adrenaline you were getting even if the action was happening really slowly because you've been taking your time you've been walking from literally rock to rock maybe looking for the the key or the clue or the whatever it is trying to figure out what to do next that yeah it was it was a sudden change in pace that really made you tense yeah I remember uh, this. Y- laugh at me if you will, but this this my pathetic life here is. I uh, think and things <laughs> like Gears of War and stuff. I will stop and look around and uh, try to explore. And I know that I yeah, can't yeah. explore past a certain point. I mean, they're not going to click yeah. on a door and Marcus is going to go, "That's a sweet door," you know, mm-hmm. or something. But <laughs> I kind of want him to. I kind of wish there was that. And and people can think that's silly, but I miss that time. I I guess I wonder, can a case be made for new adventure games, Rob? Well, yeah, I, I think definitely they can. I, I remember my utter joy of playing uh, Indigo Prophecy. The feeling you get, and, and part of the reason I like those games is that you get this feeling of of being in this living world where you're not sure what you're supposed to do. Right. Yeah, wh- when our cousin Tommy would come over uh, and I showed him on Return to Zork on our dad's 386, <laughs> he's like, what if I stab the school teacher? And I was, I was like, you know, 
well, that's a bad right. idea. You want to talk to her. Don't you want to learn about her quest? He's like, no, stab her. And so we stabbed her, and sure enough, she died. And the game yeah. became impossible to complete. <laughs> so um, they actually built that ability in to just ruin it. And maybe people who like to stab school teachers uh, have ruined uh, adventure gaming in general. I don't know. It, it, maybe it's just too slow of an experience. Well, I don't think people who stab school teachers ruined it. I think it's people who... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> real, real One. world people who stab school teachers ruined this game. Yeah. You heard it here first. People want their stories told to them in a linear yeah. way. I, I for one think that yeah, there needs to be more games out there where the world feels like you know you could do anything. Yeah, I'm sure the Nintendo Wii, tech, like as a even point and click device, is going to allow for a lot of interesting kinds of. Uh, game evolution to take place using <laughs> Wiimote to stab somebody. Is yeah, the there we go. Yeah, stabbing um, teachers with Wiimotes. <laughs> that, it is not funny at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> and yet we are all laughing hysterically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's going to be it for our show this week. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you would like to send us an email, you can do so. Our email address is mail at growing dash up dash geek dot com. Uh, send us one and let us know uh, what you thought uh, of Watchmen if you read it or uh, if you know what happened to Adventure Games or if you are interested in Terminator Rise of the Salvationing Wizard. Future. Uh, yes. So uh, that's going to be it. Thank you again. My name is Brad. This is Matt. And I'm Rob. And we'll see you later. Mm-hmm.